Again, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to give the floor over to Mayor Pro Tem, Dot Miller, to give some welcoming remarks for our community conversations for an inclusive Arvada. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Carice. I appreciate you. Welcome to our second community conversation for an inclusive Arvada. I am sorry I was unable to be here for the first one. I did watch it on YouTube and it was powerful. I would like to congratulate anyone, everyone who participated. It was an excellent opening to some challenging topics. Welcome back to those who are here for the first one and welcome to those who are tuning in for the first time. As Council Member Simpson pointed out last week, we have been presented with an enormous opportunity caused by the seismic changes taking place throughout the country. Racism, exclusivity, systemic bias are uncomfortable topics to deal with, but we have started with grace and politess. We had a great turnout last week and it looks like we have a nice quorum again today. That makes me happy because it shows how strong our community is. We are all here because we are invested in making Arvada the very best place to live, work, play, and learn. These challenges are big and this conversation is just the beginning of change. But you know the old saying about how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. So thank you for participating and thank you for letting us be a part of this first big bite. This is Democracy in Action and I am proud of this community and excited to see what we come up with. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So tonight, we again are so thankful to all of you, our community members, for joining us for this community conversation. Before we get started, I do want to make a few notes. Uh, my name is Carice Canales, and I'm the Neighborhood Engagement Coordinator at the City. I'm also the Chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. And so tonight, uh, we do have some interpretation services available to those who need it. Uh, tonight, if you need American Sign Language interpretation, we have Sherry, and so you can pin her screen. And if you are needing Spanish interpretation, we have Umberto, um, and you can choose the audio if you need that service. So tonight on this call, uh, we do have a number of folks from our city team that are here to listen to all of you. And uh, we want to share with you who those members included. So tonight we have the Director of Public Works, we have the Chief Communications Manager, we have uh, the um, City Attorney and the City Clerk. We have a few members from our human resources team. We have the director of utilities, the uh, innovation manager, our police chief, the director of vibrant community and neighborhoods, and the director of finance. And so all of these folks are panelists tonight that are here to listen to you. We also have a number of members from our internal diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. So uh, we encourage you all to um, ask any questions and participate. Uh, tonight, over the next hour, we will hear from city manager Mark Devon, and he will go over why we're hosting these listening sessions and where this falls within our city priorities. Uh, the bulk of our time together will be spent with our facilitator, Roberto Montoya, who is the Western Regional Manager for the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. And so Roberto will be leading you all through a number of uh, prompts and ways for us to hear your ideas and your experiences. So we really do encourage you to make this as interactive as possible. If you would like to participate, you can use the raise your hand function on Zoom and then we will unmute you if you'd like to speak. Otherwise, if you'd like to uh, participate in writing, you can use the Q&A function and you can choose if you want that to just go to panelists or panelists and everyone. If you're on the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and to unmute, you press star six and Roberto will give reminders of these instructions. Uh, one last piece that we'd like to mention 
is we recommend that you watch this in speaker mode and that you pin Roberto's screen as he will be giving a presentation during his facilitation and we want you all to be able to see that. Uh, without further ado, I will pass it off to City Manager Mark Devon. Thank you, Carice, and thank you also Mayor Pro Tem Dot Miller for an excellent for excellent introductions into this into this process. Uh, we are here tonight uh, because we want to listen to our to our community. Uh, we are uh, our mission statement, um, as you see it on the screen, is that we are dedicated to delivering superior services to enhance the lives of everyone in our community, um, and we want to make sure that in the process of doing that, uh, we extend an invitation and welcome the diversity of our community uh, as part of that. Uh, we we survey for um, uh, for uh, how how we're doing in this area. Uh, and want to make sure that we are being inclusive of all residents. Uh, we've, we've determined a, a score based on our last survey around that, and we always want to get better. So 6.9 is not good enough. We want to get closer to 10 as much as possible. Uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, that we demonstrate that we care for people uh, through our services. 6.8 is not good enough. We want to get better at that. And, and then lastly, delivering services to our residents in a fair and equitable way. 6.8 is not good enough. We want to get better at that. How are we going to get better? We're going to listen. Uh, the, uh, Carice introduced a number of, um, of our, our leadership team members by title uh, that are uh, part of this, uh, um, you know, part of this discussion. They're here to listen as well. Uh, and part of the reason uh, why we wanted to reach out uh, and, and work with uh, a gentleman uh, who you'll be hearing from, Roberto Montoya, is because Roberto has demonstrated a real aptitude for these kinds of sessions, and we reached out to him, and he has graciously agreed to help us. Uh, so, and, and having someone that is that is um, um, independent of our organization, we felt was also really important as well. Uh, so we we are intentional about this, and we want to make sure that we hear from you. So, without further ado, uh, I'll stop and, and turn it back over to Carice to introduce Roberto. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, so as I mentioned, the bulk of the time will be spent with uh, GARE's Western Regional Manager, Roberto Montoya. So without further ado, I'll pass it off. Thank you so much. It is, it is truly a pleasure to be here. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Roberto Montoya. I work for an organization called Race Forward as the West Regional Manager uh, for the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And I, I just can't thank you all enough for inviting me to be a part of this process and to be a part of this conversation that is so necessary in this moment um, for us to lean into these conversations and, and begin to have, have them. And so I have a few slides that I wanna share today, but really what we wanna do is hear from you. And so as Carice mentioned earlier, I'll have some prompts and give you some opportunities to share because it, it is all, truly our understanding and, and, and our belief that we have to be inclusive of all voices in these processes. And I know that in the conversations that I've had leading up to this, that this is one of many conversations that we're going to be having, that this process is going to be iterative. Um, that is, this is not something, these inequities that we see are not something that we can solve in a day, a week, a year, but this work is perpetual. So I'm very excited to be a part of that and to be here with you all today. Um, uh, my preferred pronouns are he, him, his, um, and I just wanted to share this with you. So let's go through here. I, I wanna talk a little bit about, about GARE and about the work that we do. Um, so the Government Alliance on Race and Equity is a national network of, of government agencies, jurisdictions, uh, municipalities, and counties that are working to achieve racial equity and advance opportunities for all. We are a membership network. Uh, the city of, of Arvada is a member and we have over 264 members across the nation who are working to transform the public sector. Um, so there's over 300 cities. And what essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to put tools and theories into action. Um, and, and that's really essential for us is working with jurisdictions to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about our national approach, but it's talking about it is just one step. How do we make those next steps to really instituting meaningful change? 
Um, on this next one, you'll see a quick map of our network. Um, I've been with GARE for um, five months now. Prior to joining Race Forward and GARE, I worked for the city and county of Denver as the manager of diversity and engagement, doing large scale equity projects out at the Denver International Air Airport. So I come from city, so I understand, you know, how important this work is and how we connect it to community. And as you can see on this map, we are in a, so many different areas. Our origin, we started in the city of Seattle, but you can see we're spreading all over. And what's really interesting is that Colorado is the fastest growing state um, for GARE membership in the country. When I started, there was four members. There's going to be 17 and 18 as of next week. And so you can see that the momentum in Colorado to lean into this work, to talk about racial equity and, and equity in general is so wonderful and there's such great momentum. So it makes me very excited. Now, one thing I wanna talk about is, is why at, at Race Forward and GARE, why we lead with race. You know, we, we know that racial inequities are deep and pervasive. And in many instances, the, the racial inequities that we see in communities today are the same, if not worse, than we saw in the time of the civil rights movement. And I mean, it goes without saying that racial anxiety is on the rise. Race is often the elephant in the room. And, and many times people will want to avoid talking about race and make these very sophisticated semantic moves to say like, no, it's really about class or we should be talking about gender or orientation. And that's true, but we should be talking about all of it because, and, and what's really important, even giving the, the national narrative right now, which there's a chilling effect to have, to have us avoid talking about it. And what's really interesting is we know that you know, if there is something that we can't talk about, it's going to be impossible to come up with solutions to fix it. So what we're trying to do is how, as we talk about these inequities and as they manifest through in institutions and structures, we can also think about, because we're race explicit, but not race exclusive, how do these things intersect with gender, age, disability, orientation, and other areas of marginalization um, that also are manifesting in our institutions and structures. And so for us, specificity matters. Um, and the strategies and solutions that we need to address these racial and other inequities are, are not the same for everyone. And so we really do take an intersectional approach to looking at this work. Now, what's really important, I think, is, is, is when we define some terms. And so, as you can see, you, you'll see these terms a lot now. You'll hear DE&I or DIE. And, and, and while they're always put together, they're not synonymous. And so let's spend just a little a bit of time level setting on what we mean by these terms. Very quickly, diversity is the who. So how many racial, ethnic, and other identities are actually present in any given institution or space? That's what diversity is. When we're talking about inclusion, that's talking about the how. What's the quality of participation for you know, people who are different or have different racial or ethnic backgrounds in an institutional setting? Are they a part of the process in sharing in the power and benefits? And are they making changes that create more equitable outcomes internally and for the public? And then lastly, equity is the why and the what, the result. Are the lives of people who have been historically marginalized by, by the government enforcement of laws and policies and practices um, better off as a result of our efforts? to create you know, equitable policies, practices, and procedures. So essentially equity becomes the outcome. And that's how we think about this work. And we have a national practice that we do when we come to this work. And our national practice is essentially doing what we're doing right now, is at GARE we focus on normalizing and making it institutionally acceptable to explicitly identify race as a focus for the work of government. Racial equity work focuses on undoing systemic racism in organizations, institutions, and governments. And the goal of racial justice work has always been to move us towards what Vincent Harding once called a possible America, where, where inequities can be eliminated and we might together imagine and experience a multiracial democracy in which all can achieve at the highest potential. And so that's what we're here today you know, we're talking about normalizing, we're talking about organizing, um, and then operationalizing, and then visualizing something better. And I think that's where we want to start today, 
and, and has been stated here that we want to hear from you. So I'm going to, in the next couple slides, and, and the time that we have remaining, going to share some prompts. And I want you to be, I guess, ultimately, for the city of Arvada, Arvada to be this collective think tank of coming up with ways to become increasingly more inclusive and working towards, again, that outcome that I mentioned of equity. How do we get there? And so, again, I'm just so happy to be a part of this. And I welcome you all as we get here to um, this next slide. Again, there's multiple ways to participate this evening. You can uh, put you know, your comments and, and, and your responses in the Q&A. You can raise your hand and, and be requested to be unmute, unmuted. I'll watch that. If you're a telephone caller, and I do see one, someone who is a caller, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. So if our telephone caller, if you would just practice maybe hit star nine, we want to just make sure it works because the last thing we want to do is not provide you with an opportunity to talk. So if you would hit star nine for me, I want to just make sure that I, it, it shows you. Perfect. I do see that. So let's, let's start with our first question. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here. And this is again around that normalizing. So how do we create an even more inclusive city? And I, I thought I saw a hand raise, but I think it went down. So if you're so inclined, raise your hand and we'll unmute you or put something in the, in the Q&A and we can address it. How do we create an even more inclusive city? Nancy, please, please um, love to hear from you. So feel free to unmute Nancy. There you go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. All right. All right. So um, whenever I tell my friends that I live in Nevada, the perception and the name for our Vada is Aryan Vada. I don't know if you guys have heard that before or if it's news to you. So there is just this feeling that folks who are different are not welcome in our Vada. And I don't know if it's a marketing campaign or if it's um, just more awareness throughout the Denver metro area that our Vada is not like that. But there is that perception out there, I'm afraid, that Arvada needs to figure out how to overcome. Nancy, thank you so much for sharing that. Can you, really quick, while you're, st while you're still unmuted, can you say what, what that term was? You said it cut out just a little bit, and I don't think I heard it. Oh, they call Arvada Aryan Vada, A-R-Y-A-N, the Aryan Nation. Yeah, Ar I, I thought yeah. you said that. I just wanted to make sure, and I didn't want to to do that. And I think you bring up, you know, for a lot of municipalities um, who are, you know, have been suburbs and, and have lengthy histories that there are perceptions of cities that, that may not always be accurate, but they're out there. And so for us, this is why this type of work is so vital to display very publicly that we want to become more inclusive. And so that's one of the things. And I'm noticing in the chat, you know, um, the city should publicly support marginalized groups. And in the last conversation we had similar to that was like, you know, one of the uh, residents was talking about other cities have celebrations around, you know, certain groups and are looking to elevate and, and really celebrate these groups in different ways. And so I think that is one way where, where the city of Ar Arvada can look to change that narrative and then to elevate those who have historically been marginalized. Um, I saw another one that was in there talking about, you know, children and education and the role that education plays in um, helping young folks understand what inclusion means and, and, and to understand at a very early age what that means. I, um, I, I should mention that I spent six years at the University of Colorado Denver teaching in the School of Education as I finished my PhD. And I um, spend a lot of time talking about and researching how we talk about difference and race with young children and, and when we should start that. So I think it's something that needs to be talked about and how we, how we do this within our institutions and with, with, within our educational settings. 
Um, some other things that are coming in the chat. Oh, I see another hand up. Sharon, why don't you unmute and would love to hear from you. Sharon, you're on mute if you're talking. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, so uh, hola Roberto, Bienven bienvenidos. Hey, um, I was hoping that maybe we could we could think about um, in our hiring practices with the city of Arvada so that we can start hiring um, in a in a meaningful way in a thoughtful way so that we start actually um, uh, looking like a cross section of the city so that taking a look at the census then understanding that the city has become uh, more diverse and maybe looking into some of our hiring practices so that when we go places and come into City Hall, I don't feel, um, and not me personally, but residents don't feel intimidated because we're not actually talking to somebody who, who maybe looks like me. Yeah, and that's, that's very, thank you so much for that comment. Comment. And it, it's so important. And, you know, a lot of the work that we start when we're working with jurisdictions does start in, and there's a lens that's looking at talent acquisition. Does the depth and breadth of the um, municipality look like the community that they represent? And does it look like the community that they want to represent? And so the talent acquisition and hiring does become a part of that. And, and it's not just at, at the front line. It's are we promoting and our folks who are from historically marginalized groups moving up into leadership. Um, and, and those are really wonderful questions and things that, you know, as we continue to move forward, we can examine. I, I want to get to a few things in the chat because the chat at the Q&A is, is, is really vibrant right now. One of the things is, can we work on dual language signage? Language acquisition is absolutely an equity issue. Um, I recall being a young child, you know, I was raised in Albuquerque by a Mexican mother who didn't speak English. And I recall very vividly at a really young age translating as, you know, taking my mom to go get services, whether it was our section eight, section eight application or even food stamps and having to navigate that institution because it wasn't in Spanish was very difficult for me at a very young age. Um, you know, there's a couple of comments here about housing, right? That, that I, in, I think Brandon said, I think we can be an even more inclusive city through more diversified housing options and through focusing on making our neighborhoods vibrant and walkable through focused placemaking. Not everyone can afford a large house that's far from public transit and grocery stores. I think having broader housing options in areas where there are ample opportunities for people to connect, Old Town Arvada, Five Parks, et cetera, will make the city even more inclusive by giving people more options to afford a home and more places to meet others who may be di from different backgrounds and have unique identities. Brandon, thank you so much for that thoughtful and, and, and poignant comment. And I think that housing equity, I just got, a, I was presenting before this to a California Housing 2035 project um, that is looking at exactly that. How do we begin to diversify housing options and, and, and think about housing as a fundamental right? Um, uh, let me see some other ones that we're seeing here. Um, coming in the chat. The city should publicly address its dark history um, with the KKK, which was not that long ago, not trying to erase history, how do we acknowledge it, denounce it, and invest in communities who were affected by the history. And that's something, at, you know, at, at GARE that we talk about. We are not ahistorical. I think part of the work that we do does have to attend to, to, to undoing um, historical inequities and, and, and really kind of historical dark you know, spots that, that exist within our cities. And by acknowledging that and then saying, hey, this is what we're trying to do uh, to undo that and to change the narrative. So these, these conversations are so, so rich. Um, and, you know, there's some other, you know, what is a city doing to dismantle white supremacy? Um, these are issues that we're talking about a lot that need to be talked about, um, about what, you know, what these conversations are looking like. What does history look like? What does what the history of zoning look like and, and access to wealth are all conversations I think that need to be had. So I th thank you all for, for putting those in there. And I think there was also a comment about, you know, access to, to elevators um, with those with mobility issues. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we do race end, you know, and so you know, one beautiful thing about the Americans with Disability Act was that, and, and this is a part of our work, 
we talk about something called targeted universalism. So when we focus on those that are most impacted, um, everyone benefits from them. And so when we think about, you know, the American with Disability Act and closed captioning, um, even though I, I am not visually impaired, I often benefit from closed captioning when I'm in bars and I can't hear and I can read those things, even though that wasn't intended for me. Many of these, these things that we begin to institute impact everyone in a positive way. And so that's when we're thinking about equity is sometimes folks think about it from a zero sum standpoint that as we focus on those who are most marginalized, I'm losing something. But when in reality, all of us benefit from those types of policies, practices and procedures. And so thank you all for, for these comments. What I'd like to do now is, is maybe take us to, to our next question. And I would encourage you all that to raise your hand and, and we, can, we can also include in this dialogue. Again, if you're on the phone, please uh, use star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Um, we'll continue to use the, the Q&A and the raise hand function. But our next question is, what do you envision um, for our city in 20 years related to inclusion? So this is that visualizing that we were talking about as part of our national practice. What do you envision for our city in 20 years related to inclusion? So if anyone wants to raise their hand or put some comments, I'm, I'm happy to, I would love to hear from you. So what do you envision for the city in 20 years? What do we want the city to look like? What do we want the city to feel like to, to your experiences? What does that look like? So one of the things that came up in the Q&A is, is recognize diverse residents and resident areas in the cities and recruit for city committees. Recognize businesses such as the Chase Bank on 52nd and Wadsworth, Spanish speaking customers that cater to a marginalized community. So, you know, Sharon, thank you for that comment. You know, and it's talking about, you know, services that everyone can access, attending to those demographics. And I think I just saw a hand come up. So whoever wants to raise your hand, I'd love, love to hear from you. Um, Sharon, please go ahead. I see your hand is up if you want to elaborate on, on your comment as well. Yes, I would like to be in a community where seeing me is not a surprise. Where seeing me when I'm out distance running is, isn't seen as a threat. That's the community I want to live in. And Sharon, while I have you, do you feel like that's the community that you live in now? No. I have, I've lived in Arvada for 16 years, and I've been contacted by Arvada police at least 12 times while running um, west of Wadsworth. Sure. Th thank you for sending that. And I think that um, your experience is something that a, a lot of folks who... Um, who identify as, as, as a person of color has, have experienced, you know, and being othered. Um, I, I worked at the Denver International Airport for a very long time. And, and sadly, um, I was speaking to my mother in Spanish and I had someone tell me to, to speak English. And, you know, it's a very difficult thing in an international airport to have someone to tell you not do that. But I, I understand what it is that you're saying. And, and I appreciate you saying that. Nancy, I see you have your hand up. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, um, so I wanted to echo that as well. I have raised two children in Arvada, and my son is who, granted, he, he does play his music like a normal teenager. He's, not, uh, he's routinely pulled over. Uh, black kid, nice neighborhood, nice car. Um, and I will tell you the anxiety that it causes me as a parent every time he leaves the house is just unimaginable so I agree with this last person just we're seeing my kids they're not considered as threats um, or me I walk a lot and I get a lot of weird looks as well um, and so that's what I'd like to see Nancy thank you for that and while, while I have you Nancy like as we're thinking about 20 years from now what can we do now what are some of the things that we can be doing now so that we don't have that happening in the future what, what do you think we the city can do and all of us can do And you're muted, Nancy, if you're talking. And I'm not sure if we got her back, but I'll open that question to anyone. Like, what is, go ahead, Nancy. Oh, I, I would say just like really be intentional in portraying 
Avera as a more inclusive place for all people. Um, and by intentional recruiting, you know, people of color in like leadership roles and police departments and uh, teachers in schools. And it, like, like the last person said, so that just seeing me doesn't make others feel uncomfortable because there are more of, uh, there's a lot more than there are today. Just, but it's a, it's a thoughtful and conscientious thing that the city has to go after. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Amy, please feel free to unmute. I think you unmuted and then you, you remuted. So Amy, if you want to unmute, we'd love to hear. There you go. My apologies. Can you hear me now? We can. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Amy Travin, and I've lived here in Arvada for about um, seven years now. And um, I do appreciate the city taking this time to listen to its uh, citizens, um, especially people like Sharon and Nancy, who have taken the courage to speak up today. One, one thing that I kind of want to ask of the city is, you know, while they're asking us what we envision for what's a more inclusive Arvada look like, I get kind of frustrated because I think that the data, the statistics, the research that has been done over years and decades and the community that has already said things that they want to have happen, specifically from people in the Denver and Arvada area of what would be a more inclusive and a more just society that they would wanna live in has already been said. So while it's great to have these conversations, I'd actually appreciate them acknowledging that they already are aware of what makes it a more inclusive Arvada. Things like affordable housing, things like getting cops out of schools, things like making our city a sanctuary city, things like banning police department policies on use of forces that target and harm our communities of color. So that while, yes, it's great to listen to us, I believe if the city has already done the research and educated themselves, they know what to do and they just haven't done it. And I would appreciate them doing it quicker than they already are. Amy, thank you so much for that comment and, and, and also for bringing up data, right? I mean, that's an, that's an integral part of, of doing this work and of looking at what work has been done. And so I just really value and appreciate you saying that and, and, and lifting that up so that we can, you know, because words are wind, right? You know, and, until we put these into action, it, it very much is just talking. And so I really, I really appreciate you saying that about the necessity for action. And so I think that's something in the conversations that, that I've been very fortunate to have, that there is a deep desire to do that, um, especially in this moment. And, and, and it's just, I'm so thankful for you for lifting that up. I wanna get to a few things in the chat and I see several hands up and I think Mindy, I'll, I'll call on you here next, but a few things in the chat you know, I hope that, that every citizen in the city and visitor to the city feels a sense of belonging in public spaces. You know, we need to work to identify inherent racial bias and work towards un unnormalizing bias. You know, I, there was an anonymous comment talking about as a white female, I appreciate hearing, you know, Sharon and Nancy's experiences and that I had no idea that people were treated like this. And that sometimes we, 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 we have gaps in our understanding because we don't have the lived experiences that other folks have. You know, as a cisgendered male, I don't understand all of the, the oppressions that, that, that women and that those who are non-gender uh, conforming experience. I just, I can't. And so, but I can be empathetic and I can listen and I can learn and I can try and, and, and do my part to make sure that I am mitigating those things that people are experiencing. And so um, I, I just really appreciate that. I want to come to Mindy. You've had your hand up, and I'd, I'd really love to hear from you, and I appreciate your patience. Yes, thank you so much, and I want to thank the city for having these sessions. I, th this is incredible, and, and hearing from our neighbors and the people who are so brave speaking up. Um, I, I've lived in multifamily housing over 20 years here in Arvad in different areas, and I, I do see a bit more diversity in multifamily housing than you see in the single family neighborhoods. So I really, really think then that's why I made the comment about the need to have diversity 
and, and housing throughout the city so that it isn't so unusual for someone to see somebody of color walking down their street, somebody of a different ethnicity, that it's just normalized. And, and you know, in order to negate all the redlining and other, other issues that caused our white suburbs, it's gonna take an extra effort by the city to do that, as, as well as things that other people mentioned, the hiring practices, the inclusion of people on committees. But if you only have 1% minority in our VAT, it's hard to have 25 or 30 percent people of color on a committee you know you got to have people living here first in order to make that part of our city and just my, my, from the experience i've seen i'm begging city council to create strategic goals in all of your plans your five-year plans because if my experience is if it's not something that our city council has bought in on as a strategic goal and an actual um quantifiable measures, it does not happen. Thank you. Thank you and for, for saying that and talking about that. And, you know, there's a wonderful documentary um, called Race, the Power of an Illusion. And there's a housing section that's in that, that documentary that talks about the legacy of, of redlining and access to, to home loans and, and how that has created the segregation that we see currently that we're trying to to undo and so you know we do have to look to the history um, and we have to look to what we can do to undo and, and our level of effort has to meet that the level of effort that was put in to create the segregation that we have right now and so i just thank you for naming that and you know as we're taking these notes i just really appreciate you know that that we, that arvada has such a wonderfully like um just passionate, you know, citizen base that that is going to help move this work forward. And I do think I notice in the chat it says, you know, we love these talks about DEI, but I want to know what the action is for Arvada to bring about the change. We can talk all day, but it's not going to go anywhere unless there is a clear action path. And this is part of that step. We want one thing that, in my experience of working with many jurisdictions, um, one thing I would dissuade jurisdictions from doing is creating an action plan and without talking to community and continuing to talk to community because it's hard to come up with solutions if you're not including those with those solutions are trying to impact. And so this is a necessary step and, I, and in doing that process and we bring the entire GARE network of best practices, what are other jurisdictions of similar sizes doing to, to address the inequities in those communities? Are there things that we can, that we can look to, good examples that we can you know, modify to really meet the needs of the city of Arvada. So this is part of the practice and the goal is to get to implementing these things. Um, uh, Kia or Kaya, I, don't, I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Feel free to, to unmute, please. Hi, am I unmuted now? Yes. Thank you for having these talks. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things. Um, yeah, I just want for the city to be a little bit more normalized so that people aren't avoiding coming through here. I moved to the city last year and I actually would skirt around Arvada and avoid driving through here because it does have this very negative connotation. And when we closed on our property, we almost didn't close on the property because of the KKK plaque that was across from the library. And it was um, my house district rep who talked me into moving to the city for the optimism of the diversity that would be felt here. And yeah, it's been a very interesting experience being here for the year because my non-white friends will not come out to visit me a lot of times because they refuse to come into Arvada and a number of them have, you know, gone tickets, like, like really random tickets coming through here. So it's hard to get my, my non-white friends out this way. And there are all these weird perceptions of the city where people are talking about how high it is with being white. But if you look at the census data, it's actually white alone, just under 80%. And when people start looking at this, they kind of absorb the Hispanic population just because um, that, that, you know, Hispanic and Latino is not a race. So white alone is like 91%, but not including Hispanic Latinos, it's 79%. And I feel like we have a false equivalency when we start talking about this, that people cannot afford to buy homes or be in places. Yes, there definitely is redlining um, in some of these practices, but we're losing a lot of economic factors when we're not talking about diversity. And I feel like that's something the city needs to work, look at because that's how you normalize this. And like just this week, Citigroup released that report like $16 trillion that's lost economically because of racial practices that are discriminatory. 
And just today, JP Morgan Chase announced like a huge fund to try to like decrease some of these disparities. And so looking at our strategic goals for the city, we really have to normalize that the city is missing out on these economic opportunities as the Denver metro area is changing with the influx of people coming in that are looking less white, that that is something our VAT is gonna have to come to terms with, or we're gonna miss out economically of people like me that are gonna move here that can afford to go shopping in downtown, but choose not to because of behavior that I face there. I will not shop in our old town most of the time because I get the special treatment, or I get the name calling, or I get people trying to run me off the roads. And this is a very real thing when I do have the income to shop here and I just don't. So I would love to normalize not avoiding these things. And it isn't just racial, like my house district rep, we're in a very serious um, election cycle right now. And she is a transgendered rep. And what is coming about with her opponent, it's really nasty. And some of the attacks are gonna be coming on on her gender identity. That is something that as citizens here, who she's also a resident here, we should not be normalizing. So we should be standing up for her. We should be standing up for more people because our VAT is going to be looking more and more diverse. And if we want to economically benefit from this, we have to stand by these people without the false equivalency that just because you're different, you don't have the money to be here. Yeah, th thank you for your, for your comment and for your thoughts. And, and you, you said a lot. And so I really do appreciate that, you know, from, from talking about the complexity of, 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 you know, the social construction of race and who is considered a racial category and who is not, you know, as, as a Chicano man uh, that was raised by Mexican parents, that I don't have a racial category may, is very, very confusing for me. And it always has been. And so I, I appreciate you lifting that up because it does skew data in terms of how we understand who is white and who is not. And so I appreciate you naming that and all the other things that come along with with you know what it is to to be a person of color in in a space where there are not a lot of folks who look like you so just thank you so much for, for naming that um there's some wonderful things and sharon thank you for putting the list for the house we live in in the chat uh for the documentary that i mentioned earlier i i see andy i want to get to you and then i'm going to move to the next question after this so please feel free to unmute and and, and let us know your thoughts Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for taking this time into the city of Arvada and to all the participants who have shared their experience. It's hard to hear. Um, you know, I'd really like to see a more diverse neighborhood, and I think, you know, I, I absolutely think Arvada needs to do a lot to address some of the institutionalized issues that are peop that people are bringing up. But it's also so important for us as individuals to be more educated and understand how we can be allies. And, and that we have to put pressure, we have to continually put pressure on our city leadership to make these changes um, because it's hard, you know, it's a machine and it's hard to shift that momentum. Um, but the more people that are calling out for that of, of all backgrounds and skin colors and cultures um, will eventually make that happen, but we have to, we have to work together and so I would look for opportunities to do that. I mean, can the city host sessions where we talk about how to be an ally or affinity groups or create opportunities for us like this to get together and share information and learn more about each other? Um, so if we don't identify as a person of color, so if we identify as white, what can we do? How can we help? And I realize the onus of responsibility is on me to educate myself in that manner, but no buts. That's my responsibility. Uh, and it can be hard to find uh, information that you can trust and, and, and know how to help. So thank you. Thank you, Andy, for sharing that. And you know, we're talking about making institutional and structural changes, but institutions are made up of, of people. So, so much of what you were saying about how do we look internally? How, how do we be self-reflexive to make the changes needed to create a, and to, to be a part of a more inclusive society? It does start with us and there is a responsibility for us to, um, to often use our ears proportional to our mouth, listen to understand, and do that work that's necessary to, to broaden your lens, to understand the experiences of those who are different than you. And, and that there's a big level of effort that's needed to do that. And it's often, you know, it, it creates disequilibrium in us. We can become unbalanced. And 
But we know that when we're growing, that that usually comes with some difficulty, but the end result is usually better. And so well, I, I just appreciate you naming that. Um, I, I want to get to the next question um, for us to, to, to look at and to examine. And, you know, I think some of this has been answered a bit, but like, how do you all feel our battle is doing as it relates to equity? So I'd love to hear from some other folks who haven't had a chance to share yet, you know, in terms of how you feel the city is doing as it relates to, to, to equity and to, to being inclusive. I'm looking in, um, do I have any tips with my experience at DEN um, and the city and county of Denver where they got started? Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, the way that a lot of the work got started there um, was they became GARE members as well. And that's when they began normalizing, you know, that we were going to look at disaggregated data by race and start there as a way to do the work. So, and I think that's in the conversations that I've had with your leadership, I'm telling you, I, I feel a deep sense that there is an understanding that this work needs to be addressed and that there needs to be work to be done. So I really feel that. So I um, want to see uh, if there's anyone who wants to share with regards to this question, how you think we're doing. And as, as a college professor, I got really used to silence. It gets very uncomfortable for folks when someone doesn't say something, you know, it just, you almost get like that double Dutch feeling, like someone get in, someone go in and do that. But I do see a hand um, from Alicia or Alicia, I'm sorry, my, one of my sister's name is Alicia. So that's how I, I, I'll pronounce it, but feel free to unmute. We'd love to hear. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Alicia Taylor and we live in North Arvada. Um, and moved here, I think about four years ago. And I have two kids in public school here. And um, when we moved here, um, I was a little bit alarmed at the neighborhood we moved into. None of the students, or none of the kids in the neighborhood, which there are plenty of, uh, well, I wouldn't say none, very few, maybe two in the neighborhood um, attend the public school. And, um, I have noticed a trend in specifically, I'm a white woman um, and married to a white man and specifically notice that um, there's sort of, for lack of a better term, white flight about um, neighborhood public schools. And so um, what I've realized is they, they all go to charter schools and they are, you know, it's sort of this idea that um, I'm privileged enough so I get this choice and this ability um, to choose into a public charter that taxpayer dollars pay for. And there's enormous equity issues in education right now in Jeffco, um, especially in pockets of white neighborhoods. And so, in t you know, I, I'm sorry, my kids were um, being very, inappropriate, so I had to get off for a minute. But in 20 years, when I think about this visioning idea, right, it's that like neighbors are not afraid of public systems. They're not avoiding them. They're not avoiding conversations. Um, they're not um, living in bubbles. And so for me, that means housing, certainly. Um, it means acknowledging these conversations. And I know there's only 25-ish people on this call and so badly I wish there were more, right? Because there's so many people that need to be engaged in these conversations. And so for the city, I really hope that we examine and be intentional about um, practices in housing and education and making sure that, you know, white folks are not continually creating more advantage for their children. Um, and how do we create a community that allows us to not be afraid and connect people with one another. Um, and so for me, that's through public school systems. And I, 
I don't know how it's done. Um, I participate because I want to know how it's done. And so I'm really, I mean, you are amazing. You are doing a fantastic job at facilitating this conversation. Um, and I feel like there needs to be some accountability on the city's end to address some of these questions about the how. How are we addressing these things? How are we, even with these 25 folks, right? How are we going to um, appreciate and honor their concerns and respect their concerns and talk to them about change? And I know there's a task force that's in the works. Um, I don't know that it's solidified. Um, and so, I don't know, I just really, really, truly hope. Like I had the fear the other day that, oh my gosh, I need to figure this out. Like, are my kids going to school with white supremacists, right? Like, are my kids in an environment now because I live in Arvada and, and am going to the public school, right? But like, what are the values there? And so um, participating in those things is really, really critical and, and a concern. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like the, right. it might I, be a small population, but it's a population that they need to honor sure. and listen to because it's powerful and they will I be accountable. I appreciate you. I really do appreciate you saying that. And, you know, you mentioned a lot of things as well, Alicia, and I, I, you know, talking about education and, you know, that sometimes policy decisions that we make, they, you know, there's, there's unintended consequences and school choice has had that. You mentioned white flight, but in addition, you also have something called bright flight where students of color who are looking and, and have high test scores, they're also pulled out of those neighborhood schools and sent mm -hmm. to other schools. And the ways that, that schools are funded through property taxes and, and some of the federal dollars that come from rating systems continue to perpetuate inequity. And so one of the ways that we can start looking at education and, and, and neighborhood schools is, you know, I live, in, I live in Commerce City and my sons go to public school as well. Even though both of their parents have you know, terminal doctoral degrees, they still do that. And it's because we, we invest in public schools, we believe in them. So I appreciate you naming that very, very much and, and, and sharing a bit of your story with us. So thank you. I want to get to this last question because we only have a few more minutes before I turn it back over. But even if we don't get a lot of, of answers, I would love for you to begin thinking about this and sharing with, with, with the leadership of how you want this to be done. So you know, how does the community want to be involved in this work? Alicia mentioned something, you know, a little while ago about a task force, but what are other ways that we can get really creative in involving the community in, in the work that the city is committing to right now around equity and inclusion? So if anyone wants to raise your hands, we have a few minutes, but I'd love to hear from a couple of folks about this idea of, of, of ways that we can better involve the community to be an integral, you know, in, in partnership to, you know, for the city to be working as a collective towards, towards this, towards equity and towards inclusion. Sharon, please. So the city has a number of different um, committees, one of which is the festivals committee. And uh, there was a young person who earlier talked about cultural celebrations. So why don't we have a subcommittee within the festivals committee to maybe address some of those things? Um, uh, that's very exciting to me. And then also, you know, we have uh, the, 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 um, I was on the Arvada Parks Advisory Committee and then also the Citizen CIP Committee, where there are opportunities for staff to guide us into a more diverse uh, and inclusivity and then equitable uh, programs and directions. And, and we as citizens in through those committees identify opportunities for the city to move forward. Um, it, this is a two way conversation and thank you Roberto for, for identifying that, that we can't, the city can't do it on its own. And we are going to have to help steer and guide this, uh, this ship to uh, where we want to see where we're going to be in the, uh, in the 20 years. And uh, change is, is slow and change is painful. It took us a long time to wear uh, seat belts, 
Um, so, and, and it's taking in a, uh, a, a long time for us to all wear face coverings, but I think the work can be done and people are, are willing to um, make changes. And I'm just buoyed by the voices that I hear on today's call. And so certainly I think even internally to the, the folks on this uh, phone, on this um, meeting today, that if we all got together and insisted upon um, some ideas to get community involved, I think that'll go a long way. This, the, the city can't do all of the heavy lifting. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm going to get to, to one comment in the chat and then I'm going to pass it back because we only have a few minutes and I, I really want to respect your time. But Brandon said, I think the city, the city should continue to engage with residents on major decisions and projects. I think having virtual open houses, in-person houses, online surveys, speak up our data, sharing social media posts and neighborhood connection connectors are always ways that can be broadened or can broaden participation in important discussions related to the development of the city and can help um, disenfranchised voices be heard and their ideas shared. So thank you so much for sharing that. And if I didn't get to, I apologize. Um, but I do want to just thank you all so, so much for allowing me to be a very small part of, of the beginnings of these conversations, of normalizing these conversations, of organizing folks who want to see change, and then operationalizing that. And then we get to that visualizing of that the inclusive Arvada that we want to see. So really deeply from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you all for, for this opportunity and I'll pass it back to Karee. So thank you all so much. And thank you, Roberto, for leading us through this discussion. It, we at the city know that this is a really important time to be talking about this. And so we're very appreciative to all of you, our community members for participating and to going along on this journey with us. Uh, we have had two of these conversations so far, and some of the themes that we heard from all of you included that we need to look at our hiring practices as a city so that we can look like a cross-section of our community. We need to recruit people of color in leadership roles. We need to acknowledge and address our history, including uh, the activities of the KKK. Uh, we need to really take a hard look at this othering that many of you have brought up today, where you know, there has been fear and, and um, prejudice in our community, and so that we as a city can be active in addressing that. Um, and you know, as GARE has put into their framework, we need to normalize these conversations as a city. Uh, and one of you mentioned that we're missing key economic opportunities from folks that may be avoiding our community uh, because of some of these reasons. Uh, so as we continue on this journey together, the city will continue to organize internal resources. We'll work with our partners and with all of you so that together we can identify how we're going to operationalize this work and make sure that it's the right way for us to do this for our community. Um, so I'm gonna pass it off to Mayor Pro Tem, Doc Miller, to give some closing remarks and words of gratitude. Thank you so much, Carice, and thank you so much for putting this together and bringing everybody together to make this important conversation happen. Mr. Montoya, thank you so much for facilitating such an important conversation this evening. This has been an incredible, incredible time. Obviously, these are big challenges we face now, and how, how do we even start implementing these changes? Um, we absolutely do respect your concerns, and we will continue the conversation. We are listening hard. Inertia is powerful, so more than anything, we need everyone to stay involved and invested. As Ms. Davis said tonight, change does take time. I love this quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Although this is our last scheduled meeting in the community currently, I know this conversation will continue. Our city team will debrief the entire council on the conversation that we have had last week and tonight and talk about actions that may need to be taken, that definitely need to be taken. In the meantime, please continue to reach out to your city council. Our email addresses are very easy. It's our first initial and our last name at arvada.org. So my email and please, please send um, 
emails to me anytime. I am very open to conversation. I am dmiller at arvada.org. And I know I can speak for all seven of us on council that we always make time for our constituents, always. I'd like to recognize on the call tonight, council member John Marriott. Thank you for being here. As well as state representative Tracy Kraft Tharp. I see you're on the call, Tracy, thank you. And our Arvada Center's director, Philip Sneed is with us tonight as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you to all of you that took the time out of your very busy evenings, your family time to be with us for this very important conversation. Have a beautiful evening and I look forward to making, I look forward to really working hard to make our Arvada more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, again for those words of gratitude. We uh, really do encourage you all to reach out to us and um, commit to continuing this conversation with all of you. We will be sending out an email to all participants with all of our contact information and resources for finding out more information. We have a website on arvada.org and we have an email account for the DEI committee. So without further ado, have a great rest of your evening and thank you for being on this journey with us tonight. <laughs>